Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Tuesday night Q&A. Let's go. If you guys have any questions, put them in the um, comment section. Iris um, House is in the house. She's got Iris Lawrence. I know about Iris House. Um, good evening, Iris. Um, how you guys doing? How you guys doing this evening? Um, if you have any um, questions, again, uh, comments, things that you're working on, challenges that you have, questions. I didn't get a lot of questions emailed to me. So if you have questions or really um, want to know how to move the needle forward for yourself, put them in the comment section. Let's talk about it tonight. This night is all about you guys. Whatever questions you have, I'm here for you. I'm here as long as you need me to be. So if you guys have questions, just let me know. Uh, Kim Willis. Hey, Kim. Clinton is here. Clinton's always here. Um, Terry is in the house. All right, you guys. So um, I, I want to talk about a few things tonight. Um, one is the, the marketing. Well, before I get there, um, I just want to reiterate that the market is just red hot right now, that wholesalers um, are making top dollar on deals because cash buyers like myself know that once we get a property and get it under contract, it's selling right away. Like every flip that I have, and I'm trying to get more and more and more, but every flip is selling almost before, well, one, three of them sold before I even put them on the market for top dollar. Like when I say top dollar, um, both, both of the ones recently um, sold for $10,000 over list price. And I felt like I had listed it too high. Um, one even put in the contract that they would sell it for $10,000 over list price. I mean, over appraised value if it didn't appraise. And so, um, and so it's, it's a great market for wholesalers. So if you have any deals, um, uh, DJ Supa, give me a call. Uh, let me know how your appointment went. went. Um, you know, let me know. I'm happy to buy those deals from you. Happy to pay you top dollar for your deals. Greg Gamby is here. Lorraine is here. Uh, Andre Coop is here. All right. So let's talk about marketing. Um, what, what are some of the best practices for marketing? What are some of the things you guys put in the comment section? Um, what are you guys doing to generate leads? Um, DJ, you just you just um, looked at a property today. How did you find that one? Um, Coop, you get a lot of deals. How are you finding your deals? How are you guys um, marketing yourselves? And so you guys know I always say that the most important part of investing in real estate, being a real estate investing investor, the most important part, you guys, other than financing, the most important part is finding the deals, finding the deals. The investor that can find the most deals is going to make the most money. It's, it's that simple. And the investors that don't find deals, they're not going to make money. And so you've got to get a you've got to do a good job finding deals. And I want you guys to take notes. I want you guys, let's take notes. Let's write down maybe the top five. Let's stretch ourselves, top 10 ways to find deals. And then get good at one. Get get good at one way to find deals. Just let's get good at one. And so start putting them in the comment section. How are you finding deals? And then and then let's write them all down. Um, let's let's write down all the different ways so that we know when we leave this meeting what we're going to do tonight, what we're going to do tomorrow to find deals. All right. So let's let's go. All right. So number one, let me see what we have here. All right. So word of mouth. So we can put so write down word of mouth or um, let's just say uh, referral business. All right, so referral business is good. Um, so DJ said referral business. All right, Ke Kevin and Tamika is here. 
Kevin and Tamika, how are you guys finding your deals? All right, so let, let's do cold calling and direct mail. So cold calling. All right, we'll write that down, direct mail. All right, so cold calling, direct mail, we get lists, you guys. We get lists. And we can get lists um, for absentee owners. We can get lists for pre-foreclosures. We can get lists of homeowners who own their properties free and clear in a certain in a certain um, zip code. So we can get all those lists. And so then the question is, what are we doing with those lists? And so with those lists, you call, you call the list and you call consistently and you call that list um, at least four or five times. You exhaust that list or you get a virtual assistant to call that list, you guys. Um, a lot of my investors are going to places like um, Upwork.com, Upwork.com and finding um, real estate telemarketers and they're calling, they're training them. Um, they're paying them somewhere between four and eight dollars an hour, sometimes 10. But you can find a virtual assistant we, um, for four dollars an hour. We generally get them out of the Philippines and they generally um, call uh, about four hours a day, four dollars an hour, 16, 16 dollars a day. And they're making appointments for you while you're at your full time job. They're making appointments, or you can call yourself. Um, they're using um, technology like Mojo Dialer, MojoSales.com, so that um, the virtual assistants are calling automatically for them. And so they're calling, they're getting the list and calling the list, getting the list and doing direct mail pieces, direct mail um, to that targeted area, to that targeted list. And some investors are doing both. I had. Um, I had an investor join our program, our platinum coaching program, and she was a busy attorney, but she wanted to really get into investing. And so while she was at work, her virtual assistant was calling for her and making appointments. And so when she would come home, she would call the appointments and confirm the appointments. Um, she was also doing mailings and the mailings were going out automatically for her. Um, and that's how she was able to start building her business. Um, on the weekends, she would go driving for dollars. So write down, you guys, um, write down driving for dollars. Write that down. Write down driving for dollars. We're picking a neighborhood that we know that we frequent. Maybe we grew up in, maybe we live in now. If we're looking for vacant or abandoned houses. Now, again, you guys, you've got to force yourself to do these things. And you've got to do these things on a continuous basis. Um, if you say that you're going to go driving for dollars every Saturday um, between 9 and 11 o'clock, you've got to do it nonstop, nonstop. You write the addresses down. Um, most of my investors are using the app. Um, Deal machine, dealmachine.com. So when they find a property, they pull out their app, put in the address, homeowner's name comes up and the phone number. You guys should be consistent with that. I'm, I'm just going to name everything that you should be doing, the top 10. Um, and then it's just up to you to actually do these things. I don't want you doing all 10. Just pick one, maybe two, and, and master those. Be great at those things. All right, so we've got referral business. And that referral business, you guys, you gotta let the whole wide world know that this is what you do. You gotta really, I, I haven't seen anyone say brand yourself, so I'll write this down now. You gotta brand yourself. <clears throat> you brand yourself through, like Lorraine said, social media. Um, I like to wear different you know, shirts with my logos, hats with my logo. You brand yourself. That's how you get referral business. You got to purposely get referral business. Um, all right. So Andre is saying social media, bandit signs. So let's put that down. Social media. Love it. So when we talk about social media, you guys, we're talking about um, Instagram, Facebook. We're talking about um, organic posting. Like you post organically. A lot of people are using TikTok. 
They're using Instagram um, stories, reels, um, Instagram reels, um, going live on Facebook, those podcasts. I'm not, we're actually on a podcast now. And so, um, so organic posting. But then um, a lot of investors like myself, Tori, a few other people are actually using um, paid ads. And so I use paid ads. Um, for social media, YouTube, paid ads, Facebook, Instagram, paid ads, even paid ads on places like LinkedIn, um, Twitter. And so use all of those sources. Some of the top real estate investors nationally that have a national following, they're using social media. Now, most of them are organic. They're posting every day. They have a following. Um, they're influencers. And that should be the goal for you. I mean, my one of my goals, you guys, is to have 100,000 followers. That's one of my goals. Um, and so one thing that I do, and, you know, I have a staff that helps me. We post three and four times a day. You know, we started a podcast. We did a reel today. We go live here and there. And so those are the things that we've got, you've got to do to build a following. And even if your following is just a thousand people and you got those organically, you didn't pay for that. I mean, your, your cost um, per customer is zero. But now you have this base. Now you're just sending traffic to them, marketing to them, content, 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 content. That's how you brand yourself. And so um, you see a lot of top real estate agents, um, lenders, investors. Um, all the top people doing anything, um, they're posting either for themselves um, or they have a team that's posting for them to get those those followers. And that's how you create, um, you know, a, a referral based business. You've got to get that following. And that's the only way to get the following. All right. So branding, um, social media. I'm on seven. What else you guys got? Uh, did we mention postcards? Yeah, direct mail. So we mentioned postcards, um, bandit signs. And so a lot of investors use bandit signs. I always use the example of Amanda. Amanda joined us and um, she put out hot pink bandit signs. And within 30 days of us, her joining our program, her learning about bandit signs, she had. Um, a call. I went to the appointment with her. Uh, we negotiated. Long story short, uh, Amanda made thirty-five thousand dollars on her first wholesale deal using bandit signs. Um, there's a lot of different um, um, bandit sign companies. Um, I think it's either um, Signs on the Cheap or Signs on the Cheap dot com. There's a there's a number of different ones. You guys can Google it. Um, but bandit signs, bandit signs work. Um, we, we've got networking. We haven't been able to do a lot of networking because of COVID, but we're coming out of COVID. And so networking, um, we, we have to do more of that. Um, auctions, um, Ke Kevin and, and Tamika, auctions. So look, you guys, au auctions, a lot of our investors, I, I would say at least 40% of the opportunities that we're finding now um, is through auctions. And so we, we talk about auctions, um, uh, HUBZU, um, H-U-B-Z-U, HUBZU. Um, we, we use um, auction.com. Locally in the DMV, we have places like um, Ashland Auctions, um, we have auctions at the courthouse steps. Obviously, that's nationwide. But auctions are a good source. Auctions are a good source. Um, a lot of our investors are winning um, at the auction. Um, and then we do have automation, like um, PropStream, like, like Greg Gamby is putting down. Uh, PropStream um, is, a, is a great resource, uh, PropStream. Um, probate. Thank you, Greg Gamby. Probate. We love probate because um, the biggest deals that we can get that have the most spreads, that we make the most money, 
as a real estate investor, you will not make more money on any type of lead than a probate lead because 70% of every probate lead, you guys, listen to this, 70% of every probate lead, <clears throat> the deceased dies um, with the mortgage free and clear, 70% of the time. And so that's why a lot of investors go after probate. So if you guys hear about an investor making 30,000, 50,000, $100,000 on, on a wholesale deal, I paid out $120,000 a couple of years ago on a wholesale deal, it's probate. I made almost $250,000, true story, on a probate deal. Uh, it took like two, almost two years because I went under contract and two days before contract, the deceased died. The homeowner died, I mean, the, the deceased died. The homeowner died and my contract survived the death, went through you know, a small court battle, but I prevailed. But as we were waiting, the equity, you know, the the um, the, the house appreciated. Um, I'm on. I'm still on the contract for six fifty. By the, by the time, um, and this was downtown DC, right by the convention center. By the time it was ready for me to actually sell the property or wholesale the property, the value had went up to over nine hundred thousand dollars. You guys, and so I wholesaled the deal. The guy who bought it from me renovated the property, turned it into two condos and sold each one for like 1.2 or 1.4 million. Um, probate deal, another probate deal. So probate is huge, you guys. Probate is huge. Um, and then Ronald Taylor is saying door knocking. And so I door knocked. And so what I used to do was I would get the pre foreclosure list um, and I would door knock the list. Like I would go door to door, had door hangers, um, and I would door knock, you know, a pre foreclosure list. Um, especially if I would get a list. Um, so what you can do is you in any jurisdiction, there's a legal newspaper. And so in our jurisdiction, <clears throat> I subscribe to the legal newspaper and I would get it every Thursday. On Friday, Thursday and Friday, I would just go door knock. Generally speaking, they have the, the property has to be um, advertised at least for three consecutive weeks in a legal newspaper before it can be auctioned off. So I would use that time to go door knocking and I would try to save the house from going to foreclosure. Um, for most banks, if you get them a contract within two weeks of a foreclosure, about 80% of the time, they'll stop the foreclosure on a contract. Now, obviously, they have to stop it. Um, a bankruptcy totally stops the foreclosure. Um, I, I've, I've had I've bidded on properties at the auction, was walked up, won the bid, walked up to give them my deposit and sign the contract. They get a phone call. The homeowner had filed bankruptcy. And so, you know, that stopped everything. But um, so I, I, I have door knocked. Um, and so that's another way of finding deals. So let's reiterate real quick and then we'll move on. I wrote down 12 different things. You, you write these down, choose one, maybe two, and be great at them. Choose one, maybe two. Let's be great at these things. And um, let's see what we can do to generate deals. We should be finding a deal. I want you to guys to set a goal for the next 30 days. Go hard, um, no days off, 30 days in a row, you're gonna do some type of lead generation act, activity. Um, getting referral business, like, like talking to people, purposely getting referral business, cold calling, um, getting a list. You can get lists from listsource.com, listability.com, Melissa Data, you can get lists from um, PropStream. If you have PropStream, uh, Real, eFlow, you can get lists. There's plenty of places that you can get lists from to, um, to co-call. Um, so you can get lists there. Direct Mail. <clears throat> There's lots of companies. Um, Quantum Mail. Um, 
Where else can you um, direct mail? Um, Postcard Mania, the main one, I always forget their name, the cheapest one. Um, uh, so somebody will, somebody will tell me. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a number of different places that you can get your postcards from. And a lot of our investor, Vistaprint, Karen, and Karen, you're always the one that reminds me. Vistaprint, you can get your postcards from Vistaprint. Um, yellowletters.com, you can get them from yellowletters.com. I've got my postcards there as well. But Vistaprint is who I've been using lately. Um, driving for dollars, pick a neighborhood, go drive for dollars. Uh, we talked about branding. We talked about social media. Everybody should be posting on social media. Everybody should be posting on social media. Um, banded signs, we talked about that. Networking, networking with um, other investors, networking with family and friends. One thing that we didn't mention is bird dogging. Write that down, bird dogging. That's the act of having other people, family members, friends, colleagues, let them know that you're a real estate investor, but then also let them know that if they see a property that looks to be vacant or abandoned, or if they're in a conversation about real estate investing, if they give you a referral that results into a sale, you know, you'll give them a referral fee um, or bird dog fee, whether it's 500, 1,000, some people give 10% or 5% of what they make, but you will pay them and you will pay them handsomely. Why not? They're sending you deals. And so bird dogging, that's um, also a form really of, of networking. Let people know that this is what you do so that they can send you deals. Um, auctions, we talked about auctions. We talked about some automation like prop string, Probate and door knocking. Probate and door knocking. Um, let's do those things. All right. So Rashida's asking. Um, let's see. So Rashida's ask, asking, how do I verify if a number is on the do not call list? Um, I called someone and he got upset and said his number is on the do not call list and that I was the third person to call that day. And so I would say that his name is probably not on the do not call list. Most of these lists that you guys buy, they've already scrubbed that list and they take away all the people who's on um, the do not call list. So I would venture this. I mean, you obviously you apologize, but most of the list that we get um, is already scrubbed. Now, some of the list, um, we have the Haynes directory we can scrub the Haynes directory ourselves and we can just you know, hit a button that says, do not give me anybody on the do not call list. But if you guys are buying lists and, and um, Rashida, I'm not sure where you got your list from, you make sure you, you let them know that you don't want anybody that's on the do not call list. And most of them will tell you, we don't, you know, we don't put anybody, We're, we scrub our list already. And so you don't have to worry about that. Um, Short sales, I don't think I mentioned short sales, but we buy short sales. We market for short sales. I'm probably under contract now with three or four, um, just waiting on um, three or four short sales. A lot of my investors are. Um, towards the end of this year, towards the end of this year, this is April, 2021, towards the eight, um, end of this year, um, after the moratorium in June is lifted, it could get extended, but there's a foreclosure moratorium. President Biden has already extended that one time. He may or may not extend it again. If he does not extend it, there's going to be a lot of foreclosures, unfortunately. There's going to be a lot of short sales um, in the fall and winter of this year, 2021. Um, you need to be ready. Like You need to be ready. I'm going to talk about finance in a minute, but you need to be ready. And I think I talked about it last week. Get your finances in order, or at least get your marketing in order so that you can get these deals and wholesale them. But we're buying foreclosures, we're buying short sales, um, we're buying any type of distressed property. Any type of distressed property we're buying. All 
All right. So buying these properties, we're finding these properties, we're using marketing. Um, what type of properties are we buying? And, and where are we buying these properties? Where are we buying these properties? And so um, I want you guys to focus on locations where you can buy low and sell high. I always like to say older neighborhoods. We're focusing on older neighborhoods. Um, 20 to 30 years old, closer to 30, um, preferably 50 and older, preferably 100 years old. That's why investing in bigger cities is better. Um, and we're, we're fortunate, those of, those of you who live um, in the DMV where I, where I am in the DC area, you know, DC easily has houses um, over 100 years old. And older than that, now you can buy those properties that haven't been renovated, um, you know, well below market and sell them high. For example, uh, what we call east of the river um, is southeast D.C. and northeast D.C. Um, areas like um, Deanwood and Anacostia, Congress Heights, Randall Heights, um, Fort DuPont Park, areas like that. We're generally speaking, a regular three bedroom, um, three level row house. We're generally buying now for about 200, um, no more than 250,000. But we're buying around 200,000 now, but we're renovating and selling. There's a lot of houses there now that are going, easily going into 500. So row houses in Deanwood, half a million dollars now. Row houses in Anacostia, Southeast DC, 500,000, 600,000 and up in Anacostia. Congress Heights, uh, 500, Randall Heights, you know, high 400s, where we're buying for 200, we're buying for two, easily for 250 now. And, <clears throat> and renovating, putting, putting in about $100,000 in renovations and selling for about um, 500,000. In some areas, low, low, um, I mean, high 500. I mean, uh, 500,000 or high 400,000. That's the locations. Um, and those are the properties that I want you guys focusing on. When you're going driving for dollars, when you're cold calling, when you're sending out um, direct mail pieces, choose those areas. Um, but also be mindful to choose the areas that people want. Location is important. They say the three biggest words of real estate investing or real estate in general is location, location, location. And there's a reason for that. I mean, the best locations um, is where the people want to live. And, you know, those best locations, um, you get high appreciation. And so, and so high appreciation comes with you know, having the best locations, you know, properties are appreciating, um, you know, primarily because of supply and demand. And so if it's an area where a location where there's high demand, price is going to appreciate. I just, I just read an article um, a, a few days ago that said in the, in the last um, three months, of, in the last three months of this year, Property values um, in most areas have appreciated 20%, 10 to 20% in three months, you guys, 10 to 20% in three months. It's incredible. It's incredible. Here's what that means. Let's just take the lower end, 10% in three months. So the first quarter, property values have appreciated 10%. That means if that trend continues, that over the year, um, the property values will appreciate 40%. 40%, you guys. You guys don't know what that means. That means that in two and a half years, prop, if, if it stays that at that rate, which it won't, but if it did in two and a half years, guess what? Property values will double, will double in value, will double. Um, They'll probably stay more. It won't be 40%. They're probably more like um, 20%. And that's not uncommon for um, a capital city like, like DC. 20% simply means 
that properties will double in value um, in 10 years at, at 20%, 10 years. Um, and so uh, hopefully my math is right. I think it is. Uh, no, in 20% is five years, double in value in five years, 10% in 10 years. And so um, we want to pick the right areas. Oftentimes we want to pick the right areas that are giving us incredible appreciation. I, I bought a property in Deanwood, speaking of Deanwood, um, I don't know, maybe it's two years now that I bought for 200,000. Um, it's worth 500,000, three bedroom, three and a half bath, three level row house in, in the heart of Deanwood. Um, I owe a little less than 200 now, but it's worth 500,000. I have over 300,000 dollars in equity in two or three years. So that's, and so when we talk about location, you guys, whether it's location um, that you're going to wholesale a property, cash buyers want to be in those, uh, those areas. If it's, a, if it's an area where uh, you want to buy and hold, like I'm buying and holding this property, then you want to pick those great areas where you're going to get great appreciation and then even if you're flipping, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You're still going to get good cash flow if you're holding, but you want to be in areas that you're going to get good appreciation. So location is just, it's just so important. And then um, in order to get the good deals, and we'll, we'll talk about the math um, in a second, we, we, we want to focus on distressed properties, uh, motivated sellers. That's what we want to um, focus on motivated sellers. Um, that's that's what we want to do, and so um, and, and and so in order to get the numbers that we want, and I'll just go into it right now. In order to get the numbers that we want, we we need motivated sellers to fit the the, the formula um, that we go by as um, investors. And so um, let me just go over it. Um, I know I go over these numbers every meeting. I normally wait to the end, but let me just go over it right now before we get into financing. And then if you guys have any questions along the way, um, Gary has put in some numbers, um, 12.8% 12, 12 uh, in the first quarter. I think I'm reading this right, Gary. Uh, I think he's saying that 2001 first quarter up um, 12%. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's exactly what I said. I actually said 10%, but 12% in one quarter? And if that continues over um, this year, which it probably will this year, um, if it continues, uh, what's that, 40 um, 48% appreciation, that's incredible. 48% appreciation is incredible. We need to buy and hold properties and get that good equity. Um, that's what we need to do. That's two and a half years, your property value doubles. And so the math, you guys, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with the math because you guys should know the math, but let me just let me just go over it really quickly. Um, and I want you to even in this market, because the market is going to bottom out, um, there's going to be a bubble. We don't know when it is. Um, I'm estimating not this year, but you just never know. You never know what the, what the influx of um, the influx of foreclosures and short sale. That's going to put uh, more inventory into the market. Thank God it's going to put more inventory into the market. And so now real estate agents, buyers, they've got more properties um, to, to purchase. And so now the demand is going to go down some. It's going to go down some. And so now you're not going to have, you know, 20 offers on every house, waiting lines um, to get into C houses. Um, you're not going to see 10 and 20 and $30,000 um, offers above list list price with more inventory, and so the so the, it, the you know the bubble's going to burst. Um, things are going to even out, but which is fine, which is fine for us. Um, we still have to buy the properties right, 
um, no matter what, what the market is, we have to buy it right. Cash buyers, 70% of the after repair value minus repair costs, after repair value or ARV is once the house is completely renovated, um, the value of the house after it's been renovated, we call that the ARV, um, we're going to take 70% of that. So let's say we renovate a house and let, let's say it's um, in, in Deanwood and we can sell, it's renovated, we can sell the property for 500,000, we take 70% of that, and that takes us down to 350,000 minus repair costs. So we're at 350,000 minus repair costs. So let's say repair cost is 100,000. So we subtract the 350 um, by $100,000 in repair costs, and that gives us 250. So the formula is 70% of the after repair value minus repair costs. If 500,000 is our after repair um, value, we take 70% of the 500,000, that gives us 350,000. So we're at 350,000 minus 100,000 in repairs, that gives us 250,000. That 250,000 is are the maximum that you're allowed to offer the motivated seller. That's our MAO, that's our maximum allowable offer. That's 250. 250 is the maximum we're allowed to offer. And in most cases, once we find the after repair value, um, and in this case is 500,000, in most cases to take a shortcut, you guys, is you just divide the 500,000 by two, and that's pretty much what you should be offering on that property, unless it's like a burn, you know, a house that's burned down or something like that, where where the repair cost is going to be more than normal. But um, uh, average wear and tear on a property um, that's five hundred thousand. Generally speaking, the repair cost is going to be about twenty percent of the after repair value. The easiest math is just. Divide, get the after repair value, get a real estate agent, get with a real estate agent if you're not one. You can you can go to the Zestimate and Zillow and take the higher end on the Zestimate. Um, and there's other apps. Um, actually, PropStream is really good with after repair value. So you don't have to be a realtor to have access to the right comps. PropStream will give you really good after repair value. And they pull it from the MLS, the multiple listing service. So 50% of the after repair value is what you should be, generally speaking, what you should be offering on a property, generally speaking. Wholesalers, 65%, not 70, but 65% lower, 65% of the after repair value minus repair costs. Um, that's, what you that's your maximum allowable offer um, that you're allowed to make to the seller. You got to get the math. Here's the reason why I go over ARV um, and MAO every single meeting, because we're not getting the math. You guys are still sending me deals that aren't deals. That, oh, I think, Greg, I think I got a good one. You, you're not doing the math. You're hoping and praying. But you, you have to know before you send it to me or send it to any other um, cash buyer that you should know for yourself what the numbers are. You should be able to tell me. Um, but you know you're not. But then also, I see a lot of investors buying the properties wrong. And I will tell you that the number one mistake that investors make is they buy the properties wrong because number of reasons. But the first is they're not doing the math, and the second reason, unfortunately, is especially for a lot of cash buyers, you're, you know, they're just over their heads. That you need. Um, Flippers, you need someone to mentor you, coach you, with coach you, or partner with you on your first deal. I went to a property this week, uh, no, last week, last week, where they asked me to come. They they've been in the property since um, I think September, and they. You know, they kind of went over way, well, way, 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 way over budget. And there was no coach, there was no mentor, there was no partner, none of that. And I felt so bad. Um, 
And so they wanted me to come and, you know, give my opinion, uh, maybe get one of my crews to, to um, help. But you got to know what you're doing, you guys. Um, and everything that looks good is not. All that glitters is not gold. You, you see a property, it looks like it's a good deal, and it might be. But if you don't have a lot of experience, then you got to get somebody. It's okay to split the profits. It's okay to get a piece. <clears throat> the key is to learn. Like when I first got started, I, I'm in my 20s. I don't know about this stuff, but I was good at finding deals. So I was happy to partner with people. I would find the deals, they would put up the money. We would split the profits, I was happy. Because I knew that there was a greater gain or greater, a greater good. I'm learning, 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 learning. <coughs> and I knew pretty soon I'd be able to do them on my own, but I took my time. And pretty soon I was able to do them. It didn't take me long, a couple years. All right, I'm ready to go, come on. But let's go. I've got my money. I've got my experience. <clears throat> Found a crew. <clears throat> I'm ready. And so sometimes, you guys, that's what it takes. Like you got to get, you know, five deals or more under your belt before you can do them by yourself. But the key is you've got to know the numbers. Now, the difference between what the wholesaler puts the property um on the contract for and what the cash buyer puts the property on the contract for is 5%. It's a difference of 5%. So honestly, you could just take 5% um, of the after repair value. Um, and so and so in this case, in this case, it's um, 500,000. So generally speaking, as a wholesaler, you should be making uh, $25,000 wholesale fee on this property, on this on this scenario, case study. Um, because 5% of 500,000, 5% is your profit. So you should be making 25,000 um, on, 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 on this scenario that I just gave you guys. Um, the difference is 5%, 5% uh, of 500,000 is 25,000. Uh, and so that that's the um, that's the profit that you make um, in 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 this scenario. All right, so a um, couple shortcuts. I think I've mentioned them. Repair costs should be about twenty percent of the um, after repair value. Profit should be profit um, for a wholesaler should be about five percent of the after repair value. Profit for the cash buyer should be about 20% um, of the after repair value. So in that case study, 500,000, 20%, that's 100,000. You should be making $100,000. If, if you sell something for a half a million dollars, the minimum you should be making is, is 20%, which is $100,000. That's what you should be making. That's what I want to make. And that's, that's in a perfect world. It doesn't always, it's not always perfect. Matter of fact, most of, most times it's not perfect, but just kind of in your mind, um, you should want to make that, and so you should try to do everything you can to make twenty percent. All right. <clears throat> um, again, if you guys have any questions, I want to talk about one more thing, um, and then if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If, if you send in an email. Um, with questions and I haven't got to it yet, go ahead and put in the um, comment section. And some of you guys put in questions about the Burr method. I'm getting ready to talk about that now. Um, subject to, I'm getting ready to talk about that now. All right, so I, laid, I, um, I left financing last um, for a couple of reasons. Um, as, as I said, the most important thing for me um, as far as an investor is concerned, is finding deals. Second most important is financing them, getting the money. Got to get the money. Um, you got to know where the money resides, where the money resides, where the money resides, where the money resides. I, I just, if, if y'all know what I'm talking about, put it in the, put it in the comments section. I, I just had to throw that out there. Some, some of you guys don't know what I'm talking about right now. But anyway, um, financing, how, how are we financing our deals? How are you financing your deals? Um, using a hard money lender or using cash? Are you using um, 
a commercial lender, private lender? Um, are you <laughs> are you using um, creative financing strategies? Gary's the only one with me. Gary's my boy. Gary's the only one with me. Um, how how are you um, financing your deals? Um, are you using a combination of um, different strategies? So let's talk about them really quickly. Um, cash. Um, the only only way that um, I'm going to use cash is if I'm going to use the. I know that I'm going to refinance and probably uh, use the bird method and get all my money back. Um, so how are you going to finance? Charvita says all of the above. So I I I do use um, cash, but only like in Baltimore, where I know I'm going to use the bird method, and so I'll use cash. But for the most part. I don't want you guys really using your cash. Save your cash for um, change orders. Um, save your cash for things that go wrong in the deal. We want to use other people's money to make ourselves wealthy. And so I say I try to to um, save my cash. So cash is the first thing. Um, I do use cash, but only um, in an attempt to. Um, buy the property fast. Um, you know, sometimes you can get a better deal if you use like real cash. And so sometimes I'll do that, but knowing that I'm going to refinance and get all that cash back. And then another reason why you don't use cash because you can't leverage. Let's say you've got $100,000. If you buy a property at $100,000, you can't buy any more properties. Sometimes you can use that $100,000 over two properties, $50,000 on one, $50,000 on another or even three properties. Now you've leveraged yourself and you can make more money on the same amount of money. Hard money lender. A hard money lender, generally speaking, is a lender, is a really a private lender that's kind of formed a business that lends on the basis or the merits of the property, not, not you as an individual. Now, when I first got started investing, a hard money lender would never, ever check your credit. They just didn't do it. They didn't care about your credit per se. They only cared about the merits of the deal. They wanted their deals at 70% of the after repair value minus repair costs. And so that's all they looked at. You know, they would ask you a few questions and, and you'd fill out an application, but, and every now and then they would, they would run your credit and even, but now they always run your credit, but it's not necessarily based on your credit. If you got a great story, um, and you have some dings on your credit, they'll still let you go as long as the deal looks good. Um, and so right after the recession in 2008, or right during the recession, you know, I, I lost a lot of property. I didn't lose them. I sold a lot of properties off. My income was, I say, cut in half or was more than cut in half in 2008. Um, I had just bought my, um, my real estate franchise, Exit Realty. And it was just doom and gloom. And I said to myself, the only way I'm going to get out of this is I need to flip properties. But my finances, my credit was bad. It was just doom and gloom. I went to a hard money lender and said, look, I don't have any money. I've got found this good deal. I want you to trust me. I mean, I said a few, few other things, but like, you know, my credit is bad. I don't have a lot of money to put down. It's a good deal. He said, Mr. Bennett, I'm going to trust you. And he lent me the money. That's a hard money lender. That's a true story. Um, and I flipped the property and it was a success. I flipped another property, wholesaled a couple of properties, and then got out of that recession. Um, but on the flip side of that, recently, now I've been using the same hard money lender, not that hard money lender, but another one probably for the last almost 10 years exclusively, 10 years exclusively. I'm probably, I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm probably their top investor or one of their top investors. Here recently, I gave them a deal. My deal, some of you guys um, saw my project in Suitland, gave them that project, they rejected it. I'm like, how can you reject my project? You can't reject my project. I give you all this all this, um, all these deals, you make a lot of money. Um, I believe in the deal. You should too. 
is that Mr. Pennant, we don't like the deal. We see that there's above ground rail that's going in the backyard. There's um, solar panels on the house. We don't believe in the deal, we're not doing it. So I had to call the owner and said, look, man, it's a good deal. And I had to explain to him why. Uh, we're in a seller's market. Houses are, are, are flying off the shelf. It's in Suitland where uh, the county has put more money into that one town than any other um, town in Prince George's County, Maryland. It's a good deal. He said, okay. Here's what he said. I'm going to lend you my money, my personal money. And then, and then of course, you know, I renovated the property. It sold in a day, sold for $10,000 above list price. I mean, it, it worked out, but I say that to say that they lend on the merits of the property. For the most part, they don't care who you are. They're looking at the deal. They're looking at the deal. And so that's what a hard money lender they, they generally, generally speaking, um, nowadays, a hard money lender is, is lending on great terms. There's lots of hard money lenders you'll find that will lend at 10%. Some will lend at 8%. And that's great. When I first started many years ago, a hard money lender was easy, 13% and three points. That's easy. That was like a good deal. Some was at 16%. Now, because I'm thinking it's because a lot of competition and they're getting their money much cheaper. You can get a hard money lender for 8% and two points, 8% and three points. Um, you can get a hard money lender all day long at 10%. And you guys, 10% is good. 10% is good. And so that's a hard money lender. Um, and I know a lot of you guys are using hard money lenders. I use hard money lenders. I use hard money lenders. I have a line of credit. But I like hard money lenders because my my rate is so good and I'm only holding, I'm generally speaking, let's say I'm at 8%, which means um, on a $100,000 loan, uh, let's just say 200, a $200,000 loan, 8% over a year is $16,000, right? It's $16,000. But generally speaking, I'm only keeping um the loan for six months so i'm only really giving them eight thousand dollars um that's not a lot of money you guys i mean it sounds like a lot of money but it's really not i'm only giving them eight thousand dollars half if i'm keeping the money half the time i'm only paying them half so half of the um annualized interest rate um of eight percent on two hundred thousand is sixteen thousand half of that is eight thousand i'm only giving them eight thousand dollars and they can close me in um, two weeks. I don't have to pay a monthly fee. And so, so sometimes I prefer a hard money lender versus my line of credit um, where I, I have to put down 25%. Now my interest rate is a lot cheaper, but I have to put down, there's more money coming out of my pocket. I have to put down 25%. I have to make a monthly payment. Um, so sometimes I would rather just use my hard money lender um, because of speed, even though I, I'll, I'll end up spending just a little more money. Um, in the long run, I can do more deals because it's less cash coming out of my pocket. So hard money lender. And then the commercial lenders, um, you've got your Wells Fargo, Bank of America. I prefer you guys to use a community bank. I prefer you to use a community bank. Um, there's Revere Bank, Sandy Spring here in the DMV, Eagle Bank, um, Industrial Bank. So there's um, Capital Bank. There's a lot of um, community banks that want to get to know you. My, my community bank came out and they wanted to see what was going on. They came to my real estate brokerage. They came to a couple of my properties. They wanted to get to know me. And but because of that, you know, you know, I was able to get a seven figure line of credit through them. So that's um, that's commercial. And so here's one thing that I do. I on financing, I generally I generally try not to on my flips, try not to put up any of my own money. I'll combine um, either using hard money with uh, my line of credit. No, I. 
I'll combine either using hard money with a private lender or um, my line of credit with a private lender. A private lender is an individual. They're like a hard money lender, but they're an individual that you may know that's got either a 401k, solo 401k, just cash in the bank, um, some type of retirement money, um, or they just have money and they lend you money or they lend me money um, at an interest rate, maybe of 10%. And so I combine the two. So I'll, I generally, when I buy this last property that I purchased, I use the hard money lender for the acquisition to buy the property. I use the hard money for the rehab and I use a private lender to close the deal so I didn't have to put up any money. Um, that's a form of creative financing where I put up no money. So on my flips, I try not to put up any money. I buy them with no money down. I bring no money to the table. I bring somebody else's money. And at the end of the deal, you know, I, I pay out, pay back the hard money lender, pay back the private lender. And then the rest of the profit is mine. Um, let's talk about the Burr method. And so the Burr method, B-R-R-R-R, -R -R, if you're taking notes, B-R-R-R-R. -R -R. You want to buy the property. You want to renovate the property, rent the property, refinance the property, and then uh, repeat the process, get all your cash back. And so let me give you, um, let me give you an example. I uh, had, had an auction property in Baltimore, won the auction at 40000 and put up cash for that. Renovated the property and put in, I don't know, let's say $20,000 in renovations, pay cash for that. Um, and I, I could have used a private lender, but I, I paid cash for it. So I'm all, I'm all in at $60,000. So I purchased the property. I renovated the property. Um, and then I was able to get a Section 8 tenant to rent the property. So I bought the property, renovated the property, and rented the property. Now I go, I went to refinance the property, and I put um, property appraised for one hundred and thirty-five thousand. I took out a loan at seventy thousand and paid myself back. I paid myself back. I'm paying on a note um, of seventy thousand. My payment is around. Uh, let's just say it's. Um, 400,000 a month where the, the tenant is paying or section eight is paying me $1,200. So I'm $800 in positive cash flow on that one property. And so that's the Burr method. You guys, I bought the property. I um, renovated the property. I rented the property, refinanced, got all my cash back plus another 10,000. Now I've got that same cash that I put, um, that I purchased this property and renovated it. I have that same cash now, the 70,000. Um, I mean, it, I used 60, but I took out 70, got 10 extra, using that same money to go repeat the process. And so that's the Burr method. That's an example of, of the Burr method. Um, there was a question about subject two. And so here's what that means. It's buying a property subject to the existing mortgage, meaning you're going to buy someone's property and they have a mortgage on a property. Let's say they have a mortgage on the property of, let's just say, $200,000 um, that they could be behind. You're going to keep that, that mortgage on the property. And if the numbers work, you're going to bring that property current. And you're going to make the monthly payments. Now, all the numbers still have to um, match the Mayo formula. All the numbers have to work, still have to work with the Mayo formula. Um, for example, I bought a property in Fort Washington, Maryland. Um, buddy of mine called and said, look, uh, we can't keep up with the repairs. The tenants aren't paying, they're messing the property up. I took a look at the property. I said, the numbers are too tight. The only way that I can um, purchase this property the only way I can purchase this property is if you keep the mortgage on the property so I don't have to go through, I, I, I don't have to go through two settlements and that'll save me money and, and it makes a bad deal, good deal. So they said, fine. So they were able to get the tenant out. I, um, 
I brought the mortgage current. By bringing the mortgage current, the mortgage balance, plus what I had to bring to the table to bring it current came up to about, um, I think around $150,000, $150,000. Um, when I ran the comps, the, AR, the ARV was about $325,000. Um, then I paid the mortgage of $1,200 for three months. So $1,200 times three is $3,600. I had to put that $3,600 on top of you know the $150. Then I renovated the property, actually spent about $30,000. So I had to put that $30,000 on top of you know the the um, I kind of lost my numbers. The one my computer's acting up a little bit. Um, but look, you guys, here's the bottom line. Hopefully, I stay still. Um, I went through a lot tonight. The key, though, I think the key is that marketing piece. Let's find the deals. Um, you have to get the financing. Start working on your credit because they will check now because of you know COVID and you know a lot of other things. Um, but let's find the deals. Let's find a deal, set a goal. Let's find a deal in the next 30 days. Like hopefully you wrote down the different ways, but let's find a deal. Let, let's really start this spring off really well. Um, some of you guys are already finding deals. Uh, good. You guys know how to reach me. Let's make some money. Let's win. Let's live up to our fullest potential. Let's go. Let's go get them. A lot of you guys are killing it, killing it. I need more of you guys. Post something on social media. Um, let's do some cold calling. Keith has a class every Thursday. You guys are, are welcome, but let's go. All right, you guys, before we freeze out, uh, if you don't have any questions. Um, okay, so Shay, I'll, I'll call you offline and talk more about angel investors. We'll talk more about angel investors, Shay. And so Kim, credit scores should be about 680. Um, obviously, you want to get it over 680, but 680 is where um, you should want to be. Um, Greg Gamby, let me let me call you offline. I'll, I'll call you offline. Uh, so I'll call Greg and uh, Shay. All right, you guys, let's go. Um, lots of deals, lots of deals coming. Once they lift that moratorium, let's be the ones that are out there getting these deals. Let's put ourselves in a position to get these deals. All right, you guys, take care. God bless. And I will talk to you soon. Good night.